Today we are going to uh, talk about brassica nappers. Um, I put this very nice salad for you here because it's lunchtime and also because you would not uh, have this salad without brassica nappers for which you would not have the kale that made the salad, you probably not have the canola oil that you put in your salad and chances are that um, the animal that were used for the bacon and the cheese were also fed with canola meal. So as you saw uh, on the first picture, can, uh, brassica canapus is a crop of major economic importance. It's uh, the second largest feed uh, meal after soybean and is third most uh, produced vegetable oil after palm oil and soybean oil. It's also consumed uh, directly for its leaves or its fruit in a uh, form of kale and rutabaga for human or animal fodder. It's also used to uh, produce oil for industrial processes, such as making lubricants for machinery. And it's also a promising source of biofuel. Uh, it's also in the UK a very uh, important substitute for pumpkin carving at Halloween. <laughs> uh, by chance, or well, fortunately, that, that plant also has a very interesting uh, biology. So here I represented the triangle of few, which describes the relationship between the different uh, species in the genus Brassica. Um, Brassica napus is a tetraploid that has retained the, uh, both haploid genome from its parental uh, species that formed Brassica napus, um, Brassica rapa, and Brassica leracea. So it's a tetraploid with n equal 19 chromosome. So Brassica leracea is uh, the crop that produces broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, cauliflower. Um, it's very uh, diverse morph morphologically, as is Brassica rapa that uh, gives us pak choy, a Japanese mustard greens, some oil, turnips. And of course, Brassica napus has also this tremendous morphological uh, diversity. So for this reason, uh, brassicas have been called the dogs of the plant world uh, in reason of their um, very large morph morphological diversity. Uh, despite its very important uh, use in uh, human uh, life, and human consumption. Very little is known about its early history. For example, there is no tetraploid in the wild. Molecular studies have dated Brassica napus at 7,000 years ago at most. So it seems li linked to human agriculture. Um, and it's the geographic distribution of uh, Brassica rapa and Brassica leracea would place the origin of Brassica napus somewhere in Southern Europe. Um, because of its high phenotypic variation and the fact that ancient names are more related to the feature, the usage people made of the plan rather than a real um, taxonomic uh, location, it's very hard also to use historical record just even to guess what people uh, what were doing with Brassica napus and uh, when they started to uh, use it. Uh, as to its more recent history, we know that it was grown at low acreage uh, before the Second World War in the US and Canada. Its production has grown uh, very intensely during the war because of the high demand for industrial oil. And that production has dropped again after the war. So that was in the 50s. But if you look at the domestic consumption and the production uh, from the 80s to the year 2010 is a very sharp increase and it's uh, you cannot really it, but it's a very high um, millions of pounds that are produced everywhere every, every year so so what happened between the 80s and the uh, 50s the 50s and the 80s um, you understand that better if you know that brassica have to uh, contain the oil of brassica ha contain two compounds glucosinolates and erythic acids 
uh, glucosinolates are present in many uh, plants of the order of brassicalis. Um, that's the compound that's responsible for the bitter taste people find sometimes in Brussels sprouts. And uh, it's toxic at high doses, but uh, I want to mention also that at low doses, it's, uh, it's actually beneficial. It has been shown to have very strong anti-carcinogenic effects. Um, so a little bit of broccoli is good, basically. Uh, erosic acid is also present in uh, a lot of plants of the family of the brassicaceae. Uh, it's a compound that can be, it's a fatty acid that can represent more than a half of the fatty acid in oil, uh, in seed oil of some of the brassica varieties. Um, this compound is directly toxic, uh, even at low doses, it's toxic uh, 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 to the heart, and to the point that in 19, 56, the FDA banned uh, rapeseed for human oil for human consumption because of the presence of erosic acid. Uh, however, this is a compo compound that is very interesting for industrial processes uh, since it can be converted into a wide <laughs> range of products, ranges for, from surfactant, lubricant, uh, it can be added to decrease the uh, temperature at which uh, fluid starts not uh, flowing properly. It's even in involved in uh, photography uh, chemistry. Uh, that's also an important precursor for biodiesel uh, fuel. So what happened between the 50s and the 80s, but basically there are too many, uh, two main breeding programs in Canada that uh, managed to remove these two compounds from uh, the brassica oil. So um, after uh, exchanging information and working which uh, uh, accession would um, have low erosic acid and low uh, glucosinolate they could produce in 1974 the first commercial accession cultivar that has a double zero, that is zero erosic acid and zero glucosinolate. And since then, the, the consumption of brassica napus, especially in form of oil and uh, animal meal, has increased uh, enormously in, in the world. So to summarize what we have seen in this introduction, there is a lot of variety in shape, a lot of uh, probably um, underlying a large diverse genetic diversity. We know it has been used in the past, but we don't know exactly where and how. Um, this diversity has been used by re breeding program recently to develop uh, cultivar that uh, have a superior uh, quality for human cons and animal consumption, the double zero or canola varieties. And now what, what's basically the next uh, breeding challenge? Um, breeding challenge is going to produce uh, biofuel. <coughs> so um, that's how we came to work on Brassica Napus. We are part of a very large project that involved uh, different teams with the aim to develop high yielding, locally adapted uh, Brassica Napus variety that will have a oil composition that's optimal for uh, biofuel production. The project involves um, breed, breeding and breeders. It involves also chemists for the conversion process. It even, have, even has a, an extension part where people are trying to find out what is needed for breeder to adopt brassica as a rotation crop. Uh, our, um, our group is working in the very, at the very beginning of this pipeline, uh, the genomic and genetic part here. And um, this is laying basically the foundation for everything else in, uh, in reaching this goal. So it's a very important and fundamental part of this project. To um, break down a little bit this, uh, the goal of this project uh, and understand why this project ha has been developed. First, uh, you have to uh, remember that for a long time, breeding program, I've tried to uh, remove erosic acid from the different uh, brassic and ipus cultivars, but it's actually a compound that is highly desirable for uh, biofuel production. So we are trying also to uh, find a cultivar that have a better oil profile. Of course, we want to have a cultivar that are high yielding, especially in some uh, condition, which is uh, the non-irrigated uh, wheat belt in the US. Um, that's uh, adopting that as a crop should present a lot of advantages for the growers. 
uh, because it's not tied to, uh, <coughs> tied to the oil seed market. And also, um, it has been shown that uh, uh, planting and growing weed, uh, wheat, sorry, wheat after uh, brassica napus um, increase, increases uh, yield and also decreases pest and wheat, weed, wheat grass that are associated with wheat. Right. Um, the, the current cost in, in producing biofuel is uh, less than 10% in the technology, in the conversion technology per se, but it's 90% associated with uh, feedstock. And that's where our uh, project is trying to, um, to play in diminishing the cost associated with uh, the feedstock. So our part, the genomic part, has uh, two subparts, I would say. Uh, first, we want to characterize the genetic diversity present in Brassica napus and we'd like to find genomic markers that are associated with these desirable traits. Um, today I'm going to show you only results concerning the first part, which is the population genetic analysis. This is a very brief summary of the pipeline uh, uh, we used to um, obtain our data. So we planted more than 800 Brassica napus accession, um, representing both growth habits found in, the, in this species that is the spring that do not require vernalization and the winter type that do require vernalization to flower. These accession have been chosen to represent the uh, worldwide diversity of Brassica napus, um, basically grow, uh, accession growing on all three continents where you can currently find Brassica napus, America, Europe and Asia, in, uh, from more than 33 countries. From these uh, plants we extracted DNA, and then to GBS and generated something like five terabytes of raw data that uh, we sent to our analysis pipeline. So the analysis pipeline, we actually uh, developed uh, one, especially for that project in the lab. Uh, so we used our five terabytes of data uh, doing the uh, usual step where you sort um, all these reads by barcode, uh, you remove the low quality reads, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then um, we were left with uh, close to 10 billion good reads. Um, by fortunately, just when we started the project, the Brassica Napus reference genome was published, so we could align these reads against the reference genome. Um, and then, um, although we align 95% of our read against the Brassica Napus uh, genome, uh, we had roughly 30% of the reads that had more than one best match. And that is uh, because the two parental species that uh, hybridized to form Brassica napus, that is Brassica lauracea and Brassica rapa, have diverged very recently. That is roughly four million years ago, which on an evolutionary scale is small. And um, therefore the two subgenomes are very, very identical. So when you try to align against the genome, you generally uh, have a high likelihood to align the same read in the A subgenome or the C subgenome for, um, uh, from both parental genomes. So we had also, uh, so th this, uh, we, we managed to align all these reads and then we uh, proceeded to uh, SNP and genotype calling with uh, GATK which generated first uh, initially uh, in a little bit more than a million SNPs, but for the same reason as before, and because we wanted to have, uh, to be very confident in our genotype calling, we apply very strict and very stringent uh, quality control filters, and decided to use only a subset of 30,000 uh, 800 very high quality SNPs for which we, uh, we had a very high confidence in the genotyping calling. So most of our cover um, filters apply to uh, coverage um, and um, individual calling. All right, so I'm going to show you uh, four um, kind of results we obtained with this genetic data. Um, result concerning population differentiation history uh, diversity, and I will also show you a few genomic region of interest. So the first thing we did with our data was to, uh, to do a PCA, where we color each, each accession 
according to uh, its growth habit, that is winter or spring. Springs are the little crosses and winter are the squares. And the geographic origin you have in the yellow orange tones uh, Asia, in the blue tones you have uh, Europe, and purplish tones are uh, US and Canada, America. So on this uh, PCA, you see that uh, population, um, there is a fair amount of population differentiation here, uh, which oops, led us to define three major groups or three major population. One that's mainly winter Europe, one that's mainly winter Asia, and one that is spring. Here you see that all the spring are homogeneous independently of their geographic origin, so they were pulled into one population. All right, so PCA are really nice because you can see your data, but what would be nicer if it would be to be able to quantify the amount of differentiation between these groups. Um, for that, <coughs> we um, calculated FST between uh, the three major population that we just defined. So these are the results. <coughs> In the two first line, you have the FST between winter Asia and spring. Here you have the, uh, these two lines, you have the FST between winter Europe and spring, and here between the two winter groups. So uh, to help you, I also put some little colored dots that represent the FST uh, comparison that I'm uh, showing. So the take home message here is first that you see that you have a low FST, uh, or lower FST between winter Europe and winter Asia than between spring and the other population where FST is much higher, especially in the C subgenome. So FST value uh, represents the sum of the changing changes in, in, in genetic, uh, the, the, the sum of the genetic changes in any pair of population you are comparing, but we can uh, break down this sum by the amounts that occur in each population. So if we uh, call this quantity A, B, and C, uh, we can uh, represent FST on a three population tree that would look roughly like that, where the distance between uh, winter Asia and winter Europe is smaller than the distance between spring and any other population. All right, so when you have a tree like that, there are um, two possible evolutionary scenarios to explain such a tree. Uh, first, um, spring is an ancestral group, and that explains why it has a, a larger change in, in allele frequency compared to the two other groups. And then you have a common ancestor that is winter, that subsequently split into winter Europe and winter Asia. There is another possible explanation for a tree like that. Uh, spring is not ancestral, but it has undergone a rapid allele uh, frequency change, uh, most likely to, due to uh, a strong bottleneck, or selection, intense selection at a large number of loci across the genome, such as overall the selection has affected a, a large amount of SNPs. So it reflects in genome-wide statistics. In this case, we have absolutely no idea of what the tree would look like. <coughs> All right, so next I will show you uh, if uh, we can differentiate between these two hypotheses, but first I would like to just uh, quickly summarize what we have seen so far. Population are very differentiated on PCA, and there is a relatively high uh, FST between the population, especially in the spring branch. So okay, so can we differentiate between uh, the two evolutionary scenarios I presented before? Well, we can, doing, for example, a neighbor joining tree. So here I show you a tree for the A and the C subgenome. Each line on the tree represents one of our accessions. To um, make it easier to read, I summarize the main, uh, the major uh, topology of the tree uh, here on this cartoon below. So you see that in A subgenome, winter Asia um, the root would be here, and so winter Asia would be a group that's external to winter Europe and spring. On the contrary, in the C subgenome, the root would be here, and then winter uh, Europe would be the group that would be outside um, spring and winter Asia. You will notice that on none of these trees, that is on none of this uh, subgenome, 
uh, we have a scenario where spring is an outgrowth. So this analysis allowed us to confirm that the high FST in spring is more likely due to a rapid change in allele frequency um, than to the fact that spring is an outgrowth. All right, so this um, neighbor joining tree were rooted with a midpoint routing method, uh, which is basically uh, a method that takes the longest path in the tree between uh, two nodes and um, take the middle of this distance. Uh, generally, this, tree, the, this routing method works pretty well for evolutionary uh, processes, and it's commonly used, and um, it's, it's, it's fine. But um, it doesn't provide a statistical test for this, uh, the position of the root. And there is still the possibility that a search a simple method is wrong. So ideally, we would like to root our tree uh, to, test for the to uh, formally test for the position of the tree. Uh, the root and also use our data to do that. So uh, or organize our population with respect to each other in, uh, in a tree. So for that, we, will, uh, we decided to use a Bayesian uh, phylog phylogenetic inference. Uh, however, these methods generally are developed for testing a species tree. And so they don't accept the large number of taxa that we have uh, as a number of accession we have. So they don't take 800 accession. So um, to do that, we uh, design a new strategy. So basically, what we need is to, uh, to use to be able to apply this method is to simplify the dimensionality of our genetic data set. But there is a catch. We would like also to keep some representation of the genetic variability. So for example, if we just uh, re uh, summarize our tree like that, we are missing some information. For example, on this tree, you see that there is clearly different group of winter Asia. And so if we are collapsing all the winter Asia in only one uh, group, we are losing part of this information. So ideally, we would like to um, obtain something that's a little bit more flexible. So we still need to reduce the number of taxon taxonomical units to be able to apply this Bayesian inference uh, method. But we'd like to keep some of this information, especially if there are different subgroups. So to achieve that, we uh, used a Markov cluster algorithm, which is a method that's generally used to um, apply to very large data sets. It's, it's used to a cluster gene by functional annotation. So it's, it's used to, to support functional annotation in the genome. It's generally uh, looking for fuzzy relationship between um, units that you, you are inputting to the program and that looks for uh, basically trying to find the relationship that are the strongest to form clusters. So we, did, uh, we applied this method to our sequence, sequences. And it works pretty well, because here, for example, we have it's an example of, of winter Europe. And you have this in, in three colors, the three groups that the Markov clustering algorithm found. And they absolutely make sense uh, if you plot them on a PCA of just the winter Europe, for example. So then for each of these group, we took all the accession that were in each cluster, and we made a, we derived a consensus sequence that would represent the diversity for all these groups. So with this method, we could, uh, starting from 212 winter Asia accession, we were down to three winter Asia consensus, uh, effectively uh, reducing the, the complexity of our data set while conserving a little bit of the information that there are different subgroup within each population. Um, and then um, <coughs> what we did is we uh, used all these consensus sequences to uh, build a, a phylogenetic tree. Each time, uh, so we repeated this process several times, each time we root the tree with one of the consensus sequences, compute the likelihood of the tree, save this value, and then repeat for another consensus sequence. So for example, here I will test the, the root here, and then I will test the root here. For each of these two trees, I'll have a likelihood value. And then uh, I can pick the best model with the maximum likelihood ratio test. So these are the two best models for the, oops, sorry. Oh yeah, I'm always confused with that. Uh, the A subgenome and the C subgenome. Um, so there are two uh, take home messages here. First. Uh, well, I see that it's a little bit small, but you have very, very high bootstrap value overall in this tree, which means that uh, the split between the cluster is highly supported. And then you see also the most maybe striking result is the fact that for the ASAP genome, 
uh, winter Asia again comes as in that group, so the best tree is rooted with one of the winter Asia group, whereas in the C sub genome, the best um, a tree is rooted with a winter Europe group. Um, by the way, this is almost exactly the same typology, uh, typology of the tree, topology of the tree as in the neighbor joining method, but at least here we have a formal um, statistical test that supports uh, this topology. All right, so a uh, quick summary of what we have seen now. We have seen in the first uh, part that uh, the high FST we saw in the spring branch is more likely due to a strong bottleneck uh, during the breeding history of spring rather than a spring being an ad group for the rest. And we also saw that the two subgenomes have very different evolutionary trajectories. All right, so now we have seen uh, how much the population are differentiated, how much uh, they diverge, how much we can cluster them in very distinct uh, units. Uh, we can also wonder how much genetic information they share. All right, so in this part, I will use two measures of genetic diversity, uh, one measure of interpopulation diversity and one measure of intrapopulation diversity. Here I'm going to ask how much of the polymorphism I observe in my panel is shared between the three populations. And here I'm going to look at the distribution of the allele within each population. And I'll show you at the end how we can combine the result from these two approaches to uh, get a better insight at the diversity in Brassicanapus. So let's start with the interpopulation <coughs> diversity. Sorry. So here we are going to uh, count the number of sites where the minor allele is present either in one population, whichever it is, or it is shared between two populations, or it is shared by the three populations. And I'm going to uh, use these counts to uh, produce a Venn diagram. So here are the results for the C and the S subgenome again. Um, what you can see here, there are um, maybe three main features you can uh, remember. First, the number of segregating sites that share an allele uh, between the three, the polymorphism that's shared between the three populations is roughly, both in the A and the C subgenome, 30% of the SNPs, which is relatively low, actually. Um, and then you have roughly 20, 25% of the SNPs that, is, that are a only found in a single population, so a case like that, right? So these are this part of the Venn diagram. And then uh, strikingly, spring has a much lower number of uh, population-specific SNPs and SNP overall, which is a, uh, the size of the uh, circle. So here, SNP, uh, for example, spring has almost half the diversity you find in winter Europe. However, doing that, uh, there is a little catch. Uh, we forgot to take into account the fact that our population have different sample size. There is this classical uh, population genetic result produced by uh, Watterson in 1975, where uh, you can show that uh, the, when the sample size increases, um, the number of polymorphic sites you detect in your sample also increases. Um, so for example, if I have a sample size of 100, I would on average, detect that many segregating sites or polymorphic sites. But if I increase my sample size to 300, I have much higher power to detect polymorphism. So we decided to downsample all the tree to the same uh, sample, all the population to the same sample size. And after doing that, uh, well, you still have roughly 30% of the alleles that are shared between the three populations. But the main, main change uh, between that picture and the previous one is suddenly the number of, uh, the, 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 the amount of diversity in winter Europe and spring uh, is roughly the same. <coughs> Sorry. So you have the same number of uh, variable sites in spring and winter Europe overall, and the same number of sites that have an allele that's present only in that population or that population. So a uh, quick summary here. Um, Oh yes, one other main feature is when you don't sample, uh, Winter Asia remain uh, the big winner with uh, the highest number of polymorphic sites. Um, so here we have Winter Europe and Spring that have roughly the same number of polymorphic sites. But um, is that enough to describe the diversity in Brassic and Apis? Well, obviously not, uh, because otherwise I would stop my talk here. But 
Um, so I'll show you how we can complement this information and what additional uh, data we can use to uh, better describe the, the diversity in each of these two groups. And that is uh, looking at the intrapopulation diversity and looking how the alleles are distributed across sample in each population. So this time I'm going to count the number of sites where the minor allele is present in one, two, three, four, etc. copies for one population only. I can do it for each population, but I'm looking only at sites that are polymorphic in one population. And then with this data, I can draw what is called a site frequency spectrum, which is more, more often represented this way. However, we decided to represent it on a log-log scale for two reasons. First, because we wanted to be able to compare the ANC subgenome, and doing that makes uh, uh, linearize the genome, so it's much easier to make comparison. The second reason is generally side frequency spectrum uh, become really, really flat, and so if you are looking at uh, intermediate frequency variants that have you are in this tail of the side frequency spectrum, generally the, the values are really small and are really hard to read on the tree. So on the graph. So by doing the log-log scale, we put a little bit more uh, of resolution in that part of the side frequency spectrum. All right. <clears throat> Here, I also had to use, a, for the same reason of, uh, as before, we have different sample size uh, between the three groups we are looking at. Uh, we also had to apply some downsampling strategy uh, to correct for differences in population size. Um, the reason is, um, because, um, as we saw, uh, population size affects uh, our uh, capacity, ability to detect variation. So we effectively applying this method make all the population comparison, uh, population uh, comparable, but we also make all side comparable because um, as we are doing GBS data, uh, GBS data have a lot of missing um, position, right? Missing genotype. So, for example, if I compare these two sites here, I can say that uh, my uh, variant A, my allele A, has a frequency of 25% uh, in the sample. But here, because of my missing data, I would infer that the frequency of the allele A is 50% uh, of the data. However, if, for example, these two SNPs are linked in the genome or close together, uh, we already know we have this intuition, <coughs> which is correct, that it's most likely not true that the frequency is here is 50%. So I apply method to correct for that effect. So main results are, so if we compare side frequency spectrum uh, two by two, so for example, winter Asia versus winter Europe, uh, on both graphs, the black points is the A subgenome and the color points are the C subgenome. So you want to compare uh, how the black line versus the color line are, uh, we, uh, in, in both. Here you see the C subgenome, that is the color line, is above the black one, uh, while here uh, the black line, uh, that is the S subgenome, tend to be a little bit over the other one. So basically in winter Asia, you have an enrichment in the S subgenome for intermediate frequency variants. You can also compare a winter Europe with spring, and here you have very, very strong features with a, an excess of uh, high frequency variant and a very strong depletion of intermediate, uh, low frequency variant. So the C subgenome of spring has a lot of, has much more intermediate frequency variant and it has much less uh, low frequency variant. So if we put this result together, as I was telling you, you can um, get a little bit more of an in a better insight of uh, to the diversity in brassica and apple. So if we put together the result of the polymorphic site and the distribution of the allele frequency within each population, well, we saw that I call sample size spring and winter Asia roughly have the same number of polymorphic sites and the number of uh, variants that are population specific. But however, with the site frequency spectrum, we saw that the distribution of allele across uh, the sample is very different. In particular, in the C subgenome of spring, the alleles tend to be shared among more accessions, so the, you have a shift toward uh, inter intermediate frequency variant, while in the uh, winter Europe gr uh, group, uh, the alleles tend to be present in fewer accessions. The side frequency spectrum is more shifted toward uh, less frequent variants. We also saw um, that the S subgenome of winter Asia uh, 
shows uh, a signal of repeated cross with brassic rapa accession. First, it has a higher diversity, but you also, we also saw, especially in a subgenome, an enrichment for intermediate frequency variants. So, quick summary here again. Uh, it's true for both subgenome, but especially for a subgenome. Winter Asia has more variable sites, which is a, due to a recent brassica uh, rapa integration, in, especially in Chinese breeding programs. And the C subgenome. <coughs> Uh, has typically uh, more common variants in spring and more rare allele, alleles in winter Europe. Uh, only a third of the minor allele uh, at each cigaretting site is uh, shared three ways. So now um, we have um, seen a lot of genome-wide or actually subgenome-wide statistics. We can wonder if uh, the genome is homogeneous, um, that is, uh, are these uh, genome-wide statistics representing every loci you find in the genome, or and uh, if all the, the loci um, would exactly tell the same story? So, for example, here, oh, sorry, to do that, I calculated. I, I took two statistics that I calculated before genome-wide, and this time I calculated I cal calculated the same uh, statistics on a pair SNP basis. So here I'm plotting the FST for each SNP. Uh, averaged uh, across uh, some windows of size uh, along the genome, and here the same for pi, uh, which is also known as nucleotide diversity. So here you see, for example, um, that um, you have a consistently higher nucleotide diversity, which is again the sign of the brassica rapa introgression. You have new alleles that have been introgressed, but uh, basically here it's it's. Uh, consistent following the same genomic genome-wide pattern. Um, but we can also define outlier regions, such as regions, for example, that had extremely elevated FST. Um, so doing that, we uh, actually define, we set a threshold in the genome, and we define 16 regions of interest. And using the SNPs that were in this region of interest, and just, just the SNP in these regions, we could uh, do a a PCA in each of these regions. So I'll show you very briefly some of the regions we found and what the what we have. So here, for example, you see uh, the purple, the, sorry, the blue line would be the FST between uh, winter Europe and spring, and it's low. And the FST between winter Asia, spring, and winter Europe, winter Asia is elevated, and that's exactly what you see on the PCA where. Uh, all this group is winter Europe and spring. They have roughly the same allele frequency, and you have a very strong differentiation of the winter Asia group, um, which uh, may uh, reflect a region for which, in which we had a repeated selection uh, for some of the brassica rapa alleles. Um, also, on these plots, the black dots uh, on top are showing the location of flowering time genes. And so, for example, here um, we may have a region that's, uh, that, that has had some selection at that uh, flowering time locus in winter Asia. Um, <clears throat> here you have a, another interesting region where FST, it's a little bit complicated to interpret. There is no clear, clear pattern. But what you see is an extremely elevated nucleotide diversity in spring. So you see exactly that on the PCA2, where uh, basically most of the accession cluster uh, together, except for a few of the spring samples that have very different allele frequencies. So this region is probably a region where you effectively have two subsets or two subgroup, very strong differentiated subgroup within the spring uh, population. Finally, I want to show you uh, some of our most interesting uh, results. Uh, search as this region on chromosome 6, where you have a PCA with a three-band pattern. When I saw that pattern, I, it immediately reminded me of uh, things that have been, I've seen before in other species, for example, here in humans, uh, in mice, and in mosquitoes or drosophila. And generally, when you observe three bands like that on PCA, it means that you have a genomic inversion. So why do you have three bands? Well. Um, first, because when you have a, a genomic inversion, you don't have recombination between the two uh, segments of different orientation. 
So the two orientations start behaving as two isolated populations that do not exchange any allele or any gene flow, right? So uh, derived from a common ancestor. So they start behaving like that. So they accumulate mutations that are locked in each background. So they start diverging. And that's why you, saw, you see the two, uh, these two bands on, PCA, on the PCA. Uh, for the, as for the intermediate band, well, they are not real population. You actually can have heterozygotes that have one of their chromosomes in one orientation and the other chromosome in the other orientation. So that's how you, you observe a three band on a PCA. Generally, they are also equidistant. Okay, and um, to finish up, <coughs> I'll show you something nice we can do with, um, uh, with inver genomic inversion. So this is another genomic inversion we have on chromosome C2. This is our largest inversion. It's almost close to 10 megabases. And um, one thing we would like to do is to think, okay, um, sorry, if, if I have a new accession that's not in this panel, or if I don't have a diversity panel, how can I know which orientation I have. And I don't want to run cytogenetic analysis. I don't want to run a PCA. I don't want to collect a lot of samples. So is there a way where I can, to, for me to know which orientation I am? So yes, you can take advantage of the fact that there is no recombination between uh, the two oriented segments. And um, so basically, if, if, if you have the two orientation here, you can have all these patterns of genetic diversity. Uh, you can have SNPs that are variable across the two orientations, and they are not very useful to tag an inversion because if I have the C, I know that I'm in inverted segment here, for example, but if I have the A, I don't know in which scenario I am. So, of course, the sites that are not polymorphic are not interesting either, but the sites that have a polymorphism that's uh, fixed in each orientation are very interesting because we can use them as a diagnostic marker for the orientation. <coughs> so this approach has been uh, applied to other uh, species too, and it's generally working very well. So here as a proof of concept, what we did is we split our population. We took only the winter Europe group, and we said, okay, can we define a set of marker that is tagging our orientation, and then test if based on this uh, set of marker, I can guess orientation pro properly in the other two groups, that is spring and winter Asia. So we defined uh, a set of 124 informative SNPs for which uh, we have the absolutely fixed for one orientation or the other. And then uh, using these markers, we try to identify spring and winter Asia orientation based on the orientation defined on the PCA, that is the three PCA block, we uh, accurately uh, assess the orientation in 100% of the case. That is, the three PCA block correspond exactly to the color I would give them if I just had the SNP, uh, informative SNP, to guess in which orientation they are. That is, if I'm not having the PCA, I would have guessed 100% every taxation in that group would be uh, of that haplotype, for example. Uh, another interesting feature is we didn't observe we didn't observe any cases where we'd have a signal that's consistent with any recombination event. So um, that's also uh, confirming that we probably don't have recombination in this region. So to summarize, we have defined 16 regions of interest. Some uh, show interesting history, if you know a little bit about the breeding history of the plant, um, and some probably reflect uh, the effect of selection at certain loci. Uh, we define also up to seven candidate regions for uh, in genomic inversion that are larger than 3.4 megabases. I say candidate because there are some for which uh, we have a lot of missing data, so the PCA is less clean, uh, but I still nonetheless uh, think that there are genomic inversions. So at the very beginning, I told you my project, uh, our project involved two phases, characterizing the genetic diversity and finding a genomic marker of interest, which would be the GWAS. To follow up on the population genetic analysis, I would like to work a little bit more on inversion for uh, two reasons. First, mapping inversion is very relevant for plant breeding for two reasons. First, it, rep it suppresses recombination. So there is no possibility to breed anything between two different uh, orientation, right? If you have some alleles in one orientation and some alleles in the other, they will never be merged into the same genomic background. 
uh, genetic um, genomic inversion also modify gene expression, and they can skew correction uh, for population structure in GWAS, but I won't go into the details. I also would like to see if this inversion would coincide with uh, some interesting events of, such as speciation events or change in growth habit, because these patterns are uh, strongly linked to uh, the different growth habits between the plants. Uh, finally, I will uh, start next week the GWAS phase. Now we have collected uh, data for three sites uh, to replicate over three years. A lot of phenotypic uh, information for uh, looking at uh, local adaptation and productivity and also uh, oil characteristics. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, doing this part and see the nice result we'll have. And with that, I would like to thank and the Gore Lab uh, for their support and feedback, and also uh, our collaborator, and in particular, Erica, who is in my co Arizona, who participated in the uh, tree uh, building uh, part of this project. Thank you. <laughs>